All right, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Catherine Lawrence. I work with the Science Gateways Community Institute in community engagement. And uh, I'm just going to give you a few bits of housekeeping before we get started with our main attraction today. Uh, we have your uh, audio turned off. We'll also, um, we'd also appreciate if you'd um, mute your video for the time being, um, just because we'll be recording this. Um, and uh, but we do welcome any chat uh, questions you have, and you can put those in chat. I'll be keeping an eye on that and sharing that with our presenters at an appropriate time during the presentation. Um, this is, as I mentioned, being recorded, so um, uh, we will be posting the recording and the slides from the presentation um, on our website after uh, after the event is over by tomorrow, the next day or so. Um, with that, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Science Gateways Community Institute as some background. Uh, the Science Gateways Community Institute was, is funded by the National Science Foundation to provide support to people building gateways in a number of different ways, as well as the, um, the users of those gateways. Uh, we, uh, we do that in three main ways. One is in support for building and running gateways. Uh, that includes hands-on consulting that we provide as the technical side of of gateway development. Um, we have consultants in other areas like usability, sustainability, marketing, and also we have um, a uh, catalog of gateways and software where we encourage people uh, who have a gateway or software that goes into gateways um, as some function um, to, to list their items there for other people to discover and explore. Uh, the other area is obviously in education and training, which includes this webinar. We also have a program called Gateway Focus Week, which if you notice on the first slide, uh, we, we are having one coming up in June and the uh, deadline for applying for that is, is uh, June 9th. Um, uh, that program is for uh, providing some, uh, essentially almost like the business context of understanding how to make your gateway successful and sustainable. So I encourage, we'll post some information about that at the very end of this, of this webinar as well, if you're interested. Uh, we offer student-focused programs, including a coding institute and an internship program, as well as a bunch of uh, resources on our website, which I encourage you to explore. Um, and finally, um, we are all about community and, the, and creating connections between those people through our annual conference. We have an online community forum as a Google group. Um, we offer a couple of programs uh, for um, people who want to be ambassadors of sorts. Uh, we also collaborate uh, with different projects uh, in a funded way and also and organizations as well. And um, we welcome any kind of guest blogs, news from you if you wanna spread the word about something you're doing um, or, or job postings um, are also an option. So um, with that, the one last request I do have of you is we do uh, welcome your feedback. We like to know how these webinars are for you. So um, at the end of this, presentation. I'll uh, part way through, I'll, I'll put this link up. And um, I hope that uh, you'll share how you find this to be and whether it's helpful as well as there's an opportunity to make suggestions about other topics. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and hand this off to our presenters today. So um, I'm really delighted that we finally got a chance to include CloudBank as part of our offerings for the webinar series. Shava Smolin is at um, UC San Diego, and uh, Rob Plotland is in the University of Washington, and they're going to talk about this um, big project, which uh, should be helpful to all of you. So with that, I'll let you guys take it from there. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, and, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to uh, speak here. Uh, so uh, my name is Shava Spallen. I'm a research programmer at UC San Diego, and I'm one of the co-PIs on the CloudBank project, and I lead the user portal development. I'll be giving this talk with my colleague Rob Potlin from University of Washington. He leads uh, CloudBank's education and train uh, 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 piece, and is also director of cloud and data solutions at uh, the UW East Science Institute. 
So um, what we're going to do is, is this talk is roughly in two pieces. Uh, I'm going to start with an overview of what Cloud Bank is and how it works. And then um, Rob is going to talk about cloud technologies more broadly and how they might impact uh, science gateways. Um, and uh, so Cloud Bank, uh, for those who might not know, is it's a five-year NSF pilot project. Uh, and our goal is to provide services that facilitate uh, researcher access to public cloud uh, resources for the computer science uh, research and education community. And this is a joint project. Uh, so at UC San Diego, uh, the project is led by Mike Norman, who's the PI, and then myself and Vince Callen as co-PIs. At University of Washington, Ed Lozowska is the co-PI there. At UC Berkeley uh, is Kathy Yellick. And our program officer at NSF is Deep Medi, who we work uh, quite closely with as well. So I'll go through some slides. Uh, I'll also do a, a short little uh, demo, um, and then I'll pause for some questions, and then I'll let uh, Rob take it from there, and he'll do a little bit more of a, a free form uh, talk. Uh, and then we're also interested in learning more about this community and seeing how uh, CloudBank might be able to, to help out. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so when we were uh, developing uh, the CloudBank uh, proposal. Um, we interviewed uh, researchers, uh, size researchers at our home institutes, and we asked them to kind of summarize what the main pain points uh, they were encountering when trying to access uh, public cloud resources such as AWS and Google Cloud. And what we did is we highlighted three quotes from here that kind of represent the three categories of pain points that uh, researchers were encountering. Um, the first had to do with uh, kind of getting onboarded to the public cloud platforms. Uh, the second had to do around learning about how to use public clouds. And then the third area was around the billing and how to manage spend. And so these were the three areas that we really focused on uh, with the approach that we took to Cloud Bank. So uh, the CloudBank website is here at, at cloudbank.org. Um, and this is just a, a quick screenshot of uh, the front page that you'll see when you, when you come visit it. And um, what you see summarized here are the three main services that we have developed for CloudBank to address some of the pain points that I mentioned in the previous cloud. Uh, slide. <laughs> so uh, for um, uh, to help address the onboarding overheads and administrative burden, we have uh, the user portal, uh, which provides APIs with information about what CloudBank is and how to get access. And then if you win an award from NSF with cloud funds, it will facilitate uh, the uh, account setup and access uh, to get you onboarded quickly to the public cloud uh, consoles. Uh, the second service is our financial operations. So this is done in collaboration with our cloud uh, reseller or fintech company in the UK called uh, Strategic Blue. And so they work with our uh, team here at UCSD to handle all of the logistics of working with the cloud vendors and paying the bills every month and also providing some optimization recommendations. And then the third service is education and training. Uh, so this is the area that, that uh, Rob leads with his team at UW and also uh, UC Berkeley uh, participates here. Uh, they provide a tool for uh, running clouds in the classroom and Rob will talk a little bit more about that um, later in the presentation. So the way that uh, CloudBank uh, works right now is that uh, because we're a pilot project, there are specific NSF solicitations that are considered to be CloudBank eligible. Um, and there have been eight uh, solicitations so far that have been released. Um, the two that are still active are uh, the SRINGS uh, 21581 uh, solicitation. And then the core solicitation is still open for small projects since that has a, a rolling deadline. Um, and you can see here a list of some of the solicitations that have closed uh, already. I just wanna highlight two of them. Um, this one, see yet size and a size solicitation closed at the end of February. And what was different about this solicitation was that um, the cloud vendors uh, also offered matching credits. So that helped uh, the money go a little bit farther. Um, and then this DMREF uh, solicitation is in material science. So this is the first non-size uh, solicitation that has been released uh, for, for CloudBank. 
So the, the way it works is that a PI would estimate their costs using one of the uh, cloud calculators um, and uh, uh, provide a justification for that and attach it as a supplementary document to their proposal. And the reason for that is that the cloud spend funds come directly to us at CloudBank and is not part of the, the formal budget. Um, however, uh, you know, so for example, if you uh, estimate uh, 50K in cloud spend, and uh, the limit of the solicitation is 500K, uh, then the amount that you put in your promo budget can't exceed you know, 450K or, or, or less. So that's the idea there. And, and the reason that we have that separation is that when the cloud uh, funds come to us, we do not charge IDC. And a lot of uh, institutes out there, or universities, uh, some do charge uh, indirect costs. And so for a lot of uh, PIs, this is one of the main benefits that they see right away is that you know, if they specify 50K in cloud spend, that's what they're gonna get when they get onboarded to cloud bank. So I have a quick uh, workflow uh, a slide to walk you through just to show you how uh, this works in practice. Um, and so the idea is you have the researchers at their home institute. Um, they will uh, submit a proposal with that uh, cloud uh, supplement uh, document uh, to NSF. Um, and then if they are awarded uh, their uh, proposal, uh, the funds from the formal budget go back to the home institute and the cloud funds come to us at CloudBank. So basically NSF will upload the award uh, to the portal, uh, tell you know, who, who the PI is and then um, what clouds they requested. Uh, we then kick off an automated process to create the accounts. Uh, we set up access for the PIs and then through the portal, they can delegate access to staff or students or any collaborators that they work with. And then once they're onboarded, they are able to then spend uh, in the cloud. Um, and we use a pay per use uh, model, which means that once you're onboarded to CloudBank, you can use any of the clouds uh, vendors that we support. Um, and you can see today that's Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, IBM Cloud, and uh, Microsoft Azure. And we're also in discussions with uh, Oracle Cloud uh, as well. Um, so what this, the nice thing about this is that you can use one calculator to do the estimate, the, but then once you're onboarded, you can use any of the cloud vendors. And so you have that flexibility uh, when new you know, services come out, you can always switch if there's a, a new service that, that uh, is available that looks like it might be a better uh, fit for your research. Um, and then as you spend in the cloud, uh, the usage data gets sent back to us. We display it in the Cloud Bank user portal uh, and also gets sent to uh, Strategic Blue. Strategic Blue pays the bills, we pay Strategic Blue, and then um, the magic of education and training will help you use uh, the public cloud resources more, more effectively. So that, that's the, 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 the main idea. Um, so what I've described so far is, uh, you know, how you can get access to CloudBank through uh, NSF Award, uh, but we also have a few other ways uh, to get access as well. Um, we do have some money set aside in our award uh, to give uh, researchers access to do some exploratory use uh, with public cloud resources, either for research or education purposes. So you can uh, request a, a discretionary or community award. Um, and as, as Rob says, this will allow you to kind of kick, kick the tires of public cloud. Um, and then the other avenue is uh, through what we call the enterprise program. And so if you think something like the Cloud Bank model would work well at your home institute, you know, either for research or academic workloads, um, we have the team at uh, Strategic Blue and at UCSD that can talk to you about how you might be able to leverage some of the Cloud Bank model uh, at your home institute. And it's okay if you have contracts in place already or you don't have any contracts in place. Uh, they'll, they'll work with you and uh, see what might fit best uh, for, your, uh, for your university. So you can please email us at help at cloudbank.org if you are interested in either of those options. And now I'm just gonna switch to a, a quick uh, demo of the portal to give you an idea of what it, functionality it provides. And um, while you get set up, so, I'm gonna give you a couple questions if yeah. that's okay. Sure, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so 
so a few questions came in. So Lisa asks, how much discount does this program get from each vendor? Um, so right now we're doing it at cost. Uh, uh, so when you come in, basically what you use is the, are the cloud calculators and that's, that's the, 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 the cost that, or the spend that is you're charged. Can I uh, add two things there real quick? Mm -hmm. um, I believe that we're getting a price break through Strategic Blue, the reseller, that's on the order of 10 plus percent over the base cost of the cloud. And it's also important to, to reemphasize uh, that University of California, San Diego and UW have a waiver of indirect costs on cloud. So you're not spending a buck and a half for a dollar's worth of cloud. And that uh, works through the cloud bank institution also. So there's no indirect cost charge uh, if you use the cloud bank mechanism. Yeah, and there, there's also a egress discount as well. So 15% right. of your data transfer um, compared to your total cloud spend will also come back to you as well. Great, and then there's another question. Um, Joe asks, when using public cloud provider calculators, are prospective PIs still finding it challenging to identify what resources they need to use and how much consumption there might be? Yeah, so so that's where Rob and, and his team come to at, at, at University of Washington. Um, and I think he'll be covering that more uh, when he uh, speaks later in the presentation. Okay, and then um, he had a follow-up question of how do researchers gain support services from cloud service partners? And that might be something you're going to talk about. Um, I'm not sure I understand the the question. You mean if they if they need su direct support from the cloud vendors? Was that the question? Um, Joe, maybe you can clarify in the chat, and then or or just unmute yourself and ask if you want. Yeah. Um... So this is really in regards to um, uh, service partners who are able to help with the enablement process on a particular cloud provider systems, um, just getting to know when the ecosystem, how to provision resources, how to optimize their utilization so that they're getting the most out of their budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll also tell you, I'll show you um, um, the cost monitoring tool that we use called Nutanix Beam to also help with those optimizations as well. So there's kind of but, the, the people but, support. That, but is there, that, that, is, there a, is there a mechanism through Cloud Bank for engaging a service partner or are they, they really, are researchers restricted to the services provided uh, directly from one of the universities uh, involved in Cloud Bank or with Strategic Blue. And, and by service partner, are you referring to the cloud vendors? Uh, no, so these are partners within the cloud vendors ecosystem that provide specialized support services around specific ah, topics gotcha. like high, high performance computing, uh, data science, okay. machine learning, et cetera. Yeah, we, we don't restrict uh, your use of cloud at all. So if, if it can be billed, uh, through that cloud vendor, uh, you, you are welcome to, to use that service. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, and then uh, we have one uh, follow-up question from Elisa. How do we integrate your billing model and account provision with our, our home institution? This is relevant when the NSF funding ends and the work in cloud bank needs to be supported by the home institution. Uh, and, and that's in a, uh, with respect to the spend monitoring. Um, or our security as well, maybe. Uh, it, well, let's see. She says it's also important when the data PI puts in Cloud Bank. Um, it, uh, sorry. Oh, it's also important when the data that the PI puts in Cloud Bank is generated at the home institution and sensitive. Do you, oh, this is a totally additional question about security and compliance, essentially, in terms of do you have. Um, BAA that covers the home institution with the cloud vendor, but I, I think um, I think that the um, the question here is uh, specific to um, I think transferring the account management uh, over when 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 it has to be a home institution supporting it, not an NSF grant. Right, Catherine. Uh, um, do you want me to? Um, yeah, sure. Go ahead. 
clarify it? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, my original um, understanding was the credit would be given to the home institution to apply to the account that's, um, you know, designated for the NSF funding. But then if this model, so the account would be completely separate from the home institution account provision processes. So Correct. then, you know, when the funding ends, then we basically have mm -hmm. to do a migration to mm -hmm. somehow and then, you know, reapply all the stuff. But then, um, you know, they are not on the same VPC. They are, you know, a lot of the security and infrastructure actually has to become back to the home institution. It's almost we have to recreate your environment. Um, so which mm. sort of doubles the work, um, so, uh, depending on the, I, I know, depending on the cloud vendor, I think with Google, mm -hmm. there may be more flexibility, but with AWS, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you are on a different VPC, as far as, you know, what I knew before, um, I haven't looked at it for, you know, maybe one or two years, but you almost have to, you know, do a reset up. In your own so, environment. So because we're managing the account, it doesn't mean that you have to use our infrastructure. If you want to set up a VPC with your home institute, that that's definitely okay. Um, and uh, so I think the, the main thing will be when we offer to you is is basically transferring that that ownership, uh, which is usually uh, just a ticket to the, the cloud vendors. Um, and so uh, you know, of course, you know, speaking because we have not yet offboarded uh, anyone yet, so this is just kind of how we, we think it'll work. But I, I think uh, it'll mostly just be the, the 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 movement of the account from our org into your home institute org. Um, it's it's when it comes to accounting, it's a lot more complicated. Trust me, we went through the same thing with other programs too. Um, so. Okay. Well, yeah, I don't want to, you know, please. Go okay. <laughs> okay. So why don't we yeah, I mean, and then if we have time at the end, you can talk more or talk directly. Right. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of show you as well, you know, some of the tools that you'll have access to. Um, and maybe that will help answer some of the questions. But um, yeah, it might be also a longer topic uh, for sure. So, okay. Well, let me go quickly through the demo. Um, right. So when you get an award uh, from NSF, basically what we do is we set up a, a fund and as a, a PI coming into the Cloud Bank uh, portal, you would be able to, to manage that fund. Um, and so here I have access to, to one fund, you know, it has a start and end date award amount and then a balance. And uh, for the balance, we basically pull uh, the uh, billing records uh, once an hour, um, but whether or not there is an update in spend does depend on the uh, billing frequency or the update frequency of the billing records. And that does vary uh, uh, cloud vendor by cloud vendor. Uh, sometimes we get updates once a day and sometimes we get updates multiple times during the day. Uh, so it just, it just varies. Um, and then we also send email notifications to let you know, like when the first 1% of your award is spent at each 10% increment. And then once you reach 20%, we'll start sending you daily reminders. Um, and then at 20% is also when we start having that, that offboarding conversation uh, with you as well. Uh, within a fund, you can have, as I mentioned, access to multiple uh, accounts. And so by account, a little bit of a generic term, but whatever the billing entity is in the uh, cloud platform. So for AWS that, that and IBM Cloud, they use the term account. GCP uses project and Azure uses subscription but we just generically refer to them as billing accounts. And so you can have access to multiple accounts in different vendors. You can also have multiple accounts in the same vendor. And that may be helpful if you want to kind of separate out the costs, uh, you know, give a, a student in your group uh, access to some funds and keep some of their work uh, separated. Um, and uh, so to add a new account or a new public cloud, you can just click on a link um, and it'll take you to a, a short little form. <clears throat> Uh, within the uh, billing account, you can uh, delegate access to uh, you know, members of your group or um, 
uh, collaborators that you work with. Um, and basically what this does is set up federated identity access into the cloud vendor consoles so that basically they can log in with their uh, home institute credentials. And so what that looks like uh, when they log in, they see this uh, middle uh, uh, square here to allow them to access their billing accounts. And so here you could see, you know, I have access to two awards, test fund one and test fund two, the accounts that I have access to. And then from here, I can jump directly into the cloud um, consoles. And uh, because we use uh, CI logon, you'll see uh, probably a familiar uh, screen. And then um, once the, the federation access is set up, um, it will pop you into the, the cloud vendor uh, console. So you can see here, have access to the AWS console, the role that I, I'm added in and the account number, uh, same is true for the, the GCP access as well. <clears throat> So, so that's just some convenience leaks. You know, we don't have to issue separate usernames and passwords. Once you're onboarded, um, you, can, you can get in using the CI logon federated uh, access. Um, and then uh, what I just briefly want to show you uh, is that uh, we do have a third party tool that we use uh, called Nutanix Beam. And it has some of this cost monitoring support where you can dig into the detailed spend um, in a little bit more detail. So you have, you can see your spend to date per month. You can see your spend to date by, by different months historical and you can drill down and get more details. Uh, there's also spend efficiency recommendations. So if you have unused resources that potentially could be cleaned up, it'll help you identify them. If you have resources that are underutilized, it'll recommend that you resize them to a smaller amount. And then if you have any changes in spend, it'll also help you identify them to uh, make sure that they are expected. So that's a brief overview of uh, Nutanix. Uh, they also have some security controls uh, or automated checks that they can run on your account. Um, and you can drill down into any of the issues that it finds. And some of them are just you know, suggestions and it's, it's totally fine and you can ignore them. Um, but then others you might actually want to, to take some action to lock down the access. And there's different uh, security compliance views that you can see uh, as well, you know, CIS and, and HIPAA uh, related views. Um, so um, that, that is available to you uh, once you get onboarded. Um, and that's the, the quick demo I wanted to show. Um, I'll head back to the slides. Um, so at a summary, um, you know, hopefully what you see that there is help at different stages of your award. At the beginning of the award, we help get you set up. Uh, during your award, we get you the spend, uh, uh, spend monitoring, um, you get access to training resources. Um, actually, I did not show you, but there is a training menu uh, that you can drop down and, and see a bunch of materials that the UW team has put together um, that's available to you and that you don't need to log in to see. Um, and then we also have a help desk uh, available as well. And then um, again, towards the end of the award, this is a, probably a learning process will help with the offboarding uh, procedure. Um, and here's some, just some uh, uh, services that we rely on, uh, CI Logon, I, I mentioned already. You saw Beam, um, the Berkeley data stack tool, Rob will talk about more. Um, we use Discourse for our community forum capability and, and Zendesk for our help desk uh, support. And then just one thing I, I wanted to mention real briefly, uh, because I, I think it might be of interest to the community uh, here, is that uh, we've had had some ongoing collaborations uh, around cloud bursting. So uh, the, uh, the PATH and OSG group um, has some cloud bursting capabilities through the HD Condor tool. And the Expanse team also has some cloud bursting capabilities on a case-by-case -case basis. And so we did a, a, a little proof of concept with the neuroscience gate where, where we created an account, um, we gave the Expanse team access to it, and then they were able to submit jobs uh, to AWS um, uh, using uh, uh, the, the, the cloud bank interfaces. And um, the way that we wanna kind of maybe take this a little bit more deep deeper is that some of the suggestions that we had is one of the things we worry about is of course our cost overruns. And so one idea we had is that because Expanse you know, is launching the job, they can estimate how much uh, spend they will, will, will spend in the cloud. 
And then on the cloud gang side, we know the user's balance. So we can, Expanse could do a quick query and say, does this, you know, uh, does this user have enough balance remaining to run this job? And that way you can prevent some overrun uh, situations. Um, and then they, they were also interested in doing kind of like a, a soft reserve of plan spend. If there's multiple people accessing the account, they kind of want to set aside uh, the funds so that there's not that somebody else doesn't spend them out before they do. And then there's ways that we can uh, facilitate uh, the permission setup uh, as well. So, so one of the questions I have for, for this community is whether <clears throat> there are uh, maybe some other science gateways out there that are interested in this capability. And if so, you know, what we could do to help uh, support that. So um, I think next what I'll do is I'll go ahead and, and switch over to and, and get Rob a chance to, to speak. <laughs> um, um, but I'm happy to take questions at, at the end of the, the talk as well. Cool, thank you. And uh, can I just check uh, what is the target end time? <laughs> uh, well, the the official end is two o'clock uh, Eastern, which I guess is uh, 11 a.m. your time. So we have about a half an hour, but or a little less than half an hour, leaving a little time at the very end for um, logistics of the next webinar. Okay. And uh, is there a preference on whether my camera is on or off? It's always great to see you. <laughs> so okay. if you're willing, yeah. Of course. <laughs> great. So thank you, Shava. I'll just pick up from here uh, with, uh, with our narrative. And um, I think that the nature of the questions here uh, both uh, reinforce my central theme and indicate to me that this audience is, is uh, definitely heavily engaged in a lot of these issues that we deal with when we talk about adoption of cloud computing. Let's uh, click over to the next slide. So um, before I get started on my narrative, um, what I wanted to do, and this is probably the most important thing I can do is uh, sort of in a, in a community of gateway focused um, people, um, where we're coming in from a cloud focus, we would love to learn from you. So uh, I would like to uh, offer you a, an invite to go and visit this uh, Padlet site. And this is basically a place where you can do uh, public commentary. Um, that's the link. And the idea here would be if uh, you are familiar with what I'm going to be talking about, or you know, you just want to share your perspective, um, you can go to the Padlet uh, site there and you can just type in whatever you like. Uh, remember that it'll be pu public and the content that we get there will get sort of factored back into this presentation as an artifact. So we're interested in knowing what software you use and perhaps what your obstacles or challenges are in working in the gateway space. Um, as Shava pointed out a minute ago, we would love to be able to integrate gateway needs with the cloud bank um, sort of spending model and, and back office functionality. Um, so I think having done a little bit of work in the, in the past in my career on uh, science gateways, particularly in geosciences, um, the the thought that I have, uh, even though I'm not working on gateway stuff right now, is that there may be a commonality in between uh, cloud computing for research and uh, gateway development, which is the, the question of uptake. You know, you, you, you build something or you've got a solution. Uh, are people actively taking that on and internalizing it, making it part of their process? And how do you measure that? Uh, you know, what's the, what's the way to approach the problem of up uptake? Uh, once you've got something uh, that you can communicate is, is a really powerful, beneficial solution. So my goal here is to talk about that in terms of the cloud stack, to connect that at a couple points conceptually to uh, at least my idea of gateways. Um, and I think that uh, one of the things that's been identified in the question questions is that there are more than one uh, problems to solve in addressing the cloud uh, and cloud adoption. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with just the tactics and the me mechanical aspects of, of uh, account management. So cloud bank has this one big huge advantage possibly over working directly from an institution that there's the uh, indirect cost waiver. Um, but there's also just the question of uh, getting researchers to be aware of the uh, cloud as an opportunity for research computing. Uh, and then, of course, all the optimization problems. 
And then there's the question of what happens at the end of the project. Um, not only is it uh, challenging to estimate cost in advance, uh, and we're trying to build in some sort of shock absorbers or insurance policy or however you want to put it, error bars, let's say, um, but then what happens at the end of the project and what's the off-ramp process? So internally in the cloud bank program, what we do is we talk about protocols and how do we set up protocols so that we can intervene with the researcher before something becomes a problem? For example, if you want to provision a data set that you worked for five years to create and you want to make that available for another five years, what's the mechanism for doing that in such a way that, that nobody is uh, you know, shorted uh, funding and uh, the data are available? Okay, so let's see. Um, I mentioned that there's uh, the, the Padlet and there's some other prompts here. So I think well, this is probably sat here for long enough for, for everybody to check it out. Let's move on to the next slide. So uh, if you are uh, new to uh, cloud computing, uh, there's a mixed metaphor about the cloud that I'm very fond of, which is that the cloud is itself, uh, you know, it's, it's networking and it's storage and it's compute. But then it's all these services that are built on top of that. Um, somebody alluded to service providers, things like uh, Databricks and, and on and on. It goes, it's just a, a vast list. Um, so the cloud is actually a, it's the ground floor, it's a foundation. That's the mixed metaphor. The cloud is really a starting point. And what we wanna try and do to, uh, to optimize our uptake of the cloud, if it's the right solution for a research team, is we want to demonstrate the viability, the feasibility of what you can do on the cloud. So we spend a lot of time talking about what we call cloud bank solutions, which are uh, short activities where you build something that's useful and viable and you can say, aha, I can see how this would connect to the work that my team wants to do. Um, frequently when a cloud, when a te research team is uh, looking into using the cloud, they already have a pretty good solid grasp of workflow. Let's say they're building convolutional neural nets. Uh, they know they know the drill and then the question just becomes how do we adapt into that? But there can be cases where we're communicating about the cloud as something new and we're trying to uh, open the door to understanding what the possibilities are. So of course, if you adopt the cloud, you're able to eliminate the infrastructure that you need. You no longer need to know what a rack is or what a cable is. Um, and the cloud has this enormous capacity um, across the standard data storage. Um, but then there's these sort of three building up from the ground floor from the, from the foundation ideas. Um, first of all, that there are API frameworks out there in the community, um, anything from as simple as the Python request library to uh, things like Django um, and Flask and, and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff that's available that you can bring in. Um, also, um, there's a lot, a lot of workflow containerization going on. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit more towards the end of this talk if I have time about uh, containers and that concept in relationship to virtual machines and serverless. Uh, and then lastly, there's this idea of um, no longer, uh, so subverting the idea of a data reservoir uh, sitting on a server somewhere that you then have a straw that you attach to that and you pull data back through it. Um, so we're really interested in this notion of um, instead uh, bringing the compute to the data. So uh, doing things like hosting Jupyter's uh, notebook servers uh, on the cloud. And this connects to a project that at UW we've been um, closely uh, bonded with for a while now called Pangeo. That's really kind of a leading uh, edge uh, example of uh, Jupyter Notebook hosting that connects to re, um, compute power. So I'll just take a, a deep breath here and, and digress into that for a moment. The Pangeo model says that if you are uh, an authenticated user, you can, uh, through your browser, come into a Jupyter Notebook server and you can work in a pre-built environment that has a lot of the tools that you need. This is for geoscience. Uh, and then uh, not only that, but you can use a uh, a task scheduler called Dask to uh, launch clusters of computers and do massive computational tasks. So uh, that's, that's kind of like the, the uh, poster child, if you like, for uh, bringing the researchers and their compute to the data uh, rather than the, the more traditional model of pulling down data sets. So let's move on to the next slide. So our premise is that um, Cloud computing is a 
has barriers. Uh, cost is the number one concern that we encounter, uh, learning curves and so forth, but that at the end of the day, cloud can solve your compute resource problems, particularly uh, if you are uh, suffering a data deluge, uh, which is thematically a common occurrence in research these days, because we get better and better at grabbing data or generating data, uh, but we have uh, issues with creating the horsepower to necessarily uh, comprehend it. So, um, adopting the cloud is an optimization task where you first want to evaluate, does it work for our research team? And we try and approach this from a, let's not waste your time, because if you've got a solution that already works, then that's great. The only reason to get into the cloud is because you see the, the value of that um, of itself sort of down the road. Uh, and then you have to deal with the infrastructure that you're going to build on the cloud. How does that relate to what you currently use? And then you do this optimization problem. And as I mentioned in the chat, um, Cloud Bank is attempting to do sort of first order optimization. So ideas like turning off machines when you're not using them and, uh, you know, being able to use uh, spot instances, which is a, a market that cuts the cost down quite a bit. Um, but then you get into these sort of higher level optimization and uh, the cloud bank organization uh, doesn't scale up with you know personnel and so forth to, to all solutions. So we're lo also looking to integrate what we do with the providers and with uh, other resources. So we wanna take advantage of what's available out there. Um, and we want the cloud management aspect. The cloud works best when the cloud vanishes, right? It's no longer part of your, your thought process. You wanna be focusing on your research. Uh, and so again, we turn to the things that we build up on top of the cloud. Um, for example, in our case, you know, open science, uh, we have shell get Python notebooks as the sort of uh, first thing, first step towards uh, getting away from uh, thinking about the cloud and into uh, things like um, reproducibility in research. Okay, let's move on. So here's some of the uh, nuts and bolts of how Cloud Bank tries to do the education and outreach and training aspects. Uh, we have some introductory videos. We have a community forum, so you could go there and uh, ask uh, questions and uh, get support that way. Uh, we have content built into the portal, and then we have the providers and what they're able to do. And uh, over on the right side of this thing, we sort of have the flow of understanding uh, the cloud and then writing a proposal. And we will support people who are writing proposals. And uh, then we will, once you are granted an award from NSF, uh, then we go into this sort of deeper process. Let's go to the next slide. Um, again, if, if this got uh, lost in the shuffle at all, the basic idea right now to use Cloud Bank is you see an NSF solicitation that has Cloud Bank enabled and we're working to expand that across directorates. Right now we're focused in the Computer Science Directorate, CISE. Uh, and then you come up with uh, your cost estimates and a technical description of what you're going to be using the cloud for. And if you are given the award and you decide to change to a different cloud, we don't care. So there is no commitment to a particular cloud stack. It's just to get an accurate, as accurate as possible cloud estimate. But based on the remarks that I've already made, you might guess that this is already a problem because what if you say, well, I need $100,000 for my cloud computing for five years, but you end up only needing 50,000. There's $50,000 that you could have uh, devoted towards paying salaries or doing other things with. Um, and then likewise, if you end up needing to use 150,000, what happens? So in a perfect world, NSF and Cloud Bank can say, would say something like, you know what, whatever your research computing needs are, we'll work with you over the course of your project to make sure that you can do all the stuff that you need to do. That would be like my idea of a fantastic offer to be able to make. But Right now, what we're working from is you come up with an estimate and then um, you're funded and then we try and then work with you over the course of the project to, uh, to sort of manage and make sure that we're, again, optimizing the resource. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so I mentioned uh, when I started up that uptake of the cloud is a concern or it's a sociological problem. And in my experience at University of Washington, one of the biggest ways that you can make inroads into sort of denting this, the, uh, the resistance 
is uh, through students. So it, um, at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, there is a data science course called Data 8, which is supported by uh, Jupyter Notebook servers. Uh, these are deployed on the cloud. Uh, they've driven the cost down to really low per student, and they've driven the number of students they can support up to very high. And so we have this picture here of you know tons and tons. Berkeley has managed to support thousands and thousands of students taking this Data 8 uh, data science course. And what's really nice about this is that the underlying technology is cloud. And so that sort of permeates the culture um, and other aspects of students getting engaged on the cloud, let's say in smaller uh, scale courses, we've worked with material science uh, instructors at the University of Washington, where we're actually teaching the students to log into the cloud to spin up containers and virtual machines and serverless functions to basically get a sort of uh, hands on experience with it. So this is all kind of part of the uh, rushing all possible uh, avenues that we can that we can follow in getting community awareness of of the cloud resource as an option for, for computing. Um, let's go onwards. Um, this is a little bit more about uh, some of that machinery in um, the Berkeley uh, data eight process. And I, I wanted to show this slide so you can glance at it and see some of the technologies involved. But the, the one I wanna focus on is called Binder Hub. It's the second one after Jupyter Hub. And I'll come back to that in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, as a really interesting uh, facet, let's say, of this ecosystem that we're talking about. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, and then this is the third of three Berkeley slides. And I wanted to point out that they have a number of uh, colleges that they're inter um, integrating with uh, their program and making that available. So this is really exciting for me to see uh, the, the opportunity here for Berkeley to share their technology uh, with other schools. Uh, and there's this kind of uh, buried in the text, there's this 2I2C consortium, uh, which I want to describe in detail, but basically it is a consortium of organizations that are trying to make Jupyter Notebook servers uh, universally freely available, openly available. Um, so again, there's a lot of uh, I guess I want to say democratization um, of the cloud is, is, is a fact of the cloud. If you can come up with the funding, you can use the cloud. But uh, democratization in the cultural awareness is uh, underway. And I think Berkeley is making huge strides in that, in that direction. So it's really great to have them as part of the cloud bank uh, team. OK, let's move on. OK, so this is uh, sort of pivoting now into uh, gateways and data systems. And uh, I just wanted to show this really quickly. This is a diagram of an oceanography data system. Uh, it's the Ocean Observatories Initiative. And it's the subcomponent um, called the Regional Cabled Array, which is a, an array of sensors and installations and power and data uh, off the coast of Oregon that goes off all the way off to the edge of the Juan de Fuca plate. So this is a giant multi tens of millions of dollars project. And uh, the data system has been architected and built on the cloud. And this would be an example of a complex system with a lot of moving parts. Um, so, okay, great, that's one extreme. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, and then uh, there's sort of getting simpler and simpler. More typically, you'll have data systems that focus on one type of data. Um, this is one that I happen to be uh, a fan of called It's Live. It's a successor to another one called Go Live. But the idea is it's land ice velocity. So this is a, a data system that was sort of a gleam in a glaciologist's eye. And this is where I kind of became aware of the potential for data systems to be interactive and uh, working off of um, APIs and so forth. So the, the glaciologist is named Mark Von Stock, and he described this to me like over a decade ago that essentially he couldn't get to his own data. His own data was not sitting on his disk drives. Rather, it was available through a, an API, through a service, a data service. And uh, this has sort of uh, migrated and evolved to become its life today. Um, it kind of raises an interesting for me philosophical question about data portals, uh, because if you start getting into API access, 
you can say, well, maybe, you know, Python uh, requests or wget are really simple basic access mechanisms. And what if we uh, scrap our ideas for making a complicated portal? The previous slide I showed has a really complicated, cool data exploration portal. What if you scrap that and instead put your energy into teaching uh, graduate students to use wget and uh, you know write API code? Um, I think that's an interesting conversation. It's not beyond our scope today, but I just thought I would mention it. Let's uh, move on to the next slide also. Uh, and this is basically the same question, but instead of saying, what if we put all of our energy into teaching graduate students to use wget and requests, what if we put all, all of our energy into hosting Jupyter Notebooks so that the computation is always done on the cloud next to these large data archives where we have or accumulating this massive, let's say, remote sensing data set. Um, this happens to be a project for citizen science. So I thought I would mention it. Um, it. The idea is if you're out skiing and you have a wand with you, you can poke it down into the snow and measure how deep the snowpack is. And then you come back and you register this into uh, the CSO uh, database. And it's used as validation for remote sensing products, which are generating snow depth estimates all the way across the Sierras. So click on to the next slide. And then I think this is like animated. So you can just sort of show the pieces that are uh, cloud pieces. Yeah, just keep on clicking through. I think there's gonna be, yeah, that's it. That's enough clicks. Um, so those are all cloud components of the system. The thing over on the right is actually a um, Pangeo instance. So it's a Jupyter notebook host. And then there's some other cloud machinery in here too. So this is kind of a, a neat project that Anthony Arndt at uh, APL at uh, University of Washington has going on that's got this sort of backing cloud system. So hopefully there's a sort of underlying current of building stuff out on the cloud that we think is a, a, a great uh, merging of technologies. Okay, let's move on. Um, Recently, I mentioned we were, we've been uh, contributing to a material science course. It's actually a big data course. Um, and so we've described uh, virtual machines and containers and, and functions in terms of these two axes, um, where virtual machines are a little bit more complicated to deal with, uh, but they give you the ability to do everything you can do on a computer pretty much. And then of course there's cost. So um, if you're not familiar with uh, serverless functions, the idea is that you can write a little block of code and maybe wire that into a data source and have it sitting on the internet and responding to HTTP requests. Um, but there is no server. There's nothing underpinning it. That's all magically taken care of. So this sort of abstracting away the infrastructure is uh, a trend in services that are developed by cloud providers and uh, they're incredibly cheap. You can run in a serverless function a million times before they even start charging you money for it. Uh, so it's interesting to see how something that's built for, let's say, the um, you know commodities industry or for, for basically for industry uh, can be co-opted by scientists who say, hey, look, I can do a million function calls and uh, for free, you know, using the cloud serverless functions. Well, what a great idea. And then, you know, what, what can you use that for? Uh, containerization, um, my guess is you're, you're quite familiar with. Uh, it's still something I'm trying to wrap my head around, but basically it's uh, sort of small approximations of virtual machines that have tasks to do that are a little bit more complicated than serverless, uh, but not. Uh, the, but there's not a need for a full-blown virtual machine. Uh, and I mentioned, actually, let's click on to the next slide because it's very similar to this one. So I mentioned earlier something called Binder Hub. Um, I kind of jumped up and down about it. Actually, let's go back to that previous one. This one's great. Um, so Binder is, is interesting because it's also hosted by Berkeley, I believe, and it basically uh, takes a Jupyter Notebook repository on GitHub and turns it into a Jupyter Notebook execution sandbox. So if you can set up some content, let's say you want to communicate your research uh, and attach that to a Binder Hub badge, it's something like akin to going to the local uh, science museum and finding an exhibit where there's one lever that you can pull back and forth and sort of see what happens to the spectrum of light or you know something like that. It's a sandbox where 
Python executes, it's running in a container. It's on the cloud, let's say. And uh, it's sitting there running, and you can play around with it, and you can change the code and see what that does. So you can, it's an interactive execution environment. The minute you go away from it, it, it evaporates. So Binder is another element of this sort of ecosystem of ways we have of communicating what's possible and uh, communicating what our research is about. OK, let's move on. I think I'm almost to my end here. So this is just a little bit more about uh, this is my colleague Naomi Alterman's uh, uh, sort of tutorial on using containers. And that kind of brings me back to Cloud Bank and what we're trying to do with the Cloud Bank project is to communicate and demystify some of this technology. So containers, you can hear people who understand containers talk about them and still like wonder what they are. It's like, a, uh, I don't know, cryptocurrency. I still don't understand what this is. So we created a, a cloud bank solution, which is a step through tutorial uh, where you can, uh, and it's written for the researcher. So in other words, it has a researcher's perspective in mind. Oh shoot, I'm out of time. Okay, let's move on. Um, I'll try and wrap this up. Um, yes, and connecting containers to, to data sets is important. So um, I'm going to cut myself off and say that my goal here has been to communicate that cloud is great, but it's only part of the means to an end. Cloud Bank, we're working to help um, make that aware, uh, become part of our cultural awareness in research uh, to increase the uptake. And that, I think, is a chaotic run through uh, some of my <laughs> thought processes. So, so thank you very much. Let's click to the last one. I think that's the last one. Yes. OK. Well, thanks, uh, Rob. We do have a few minutes left to take questions. You can post them in chat. And um, <clears throat> what I'll do is I'll just, uh, while we're waiting for questions to show up, if there are any, um, I'm going to share my screen and just let so you can see what the upcoming uh, webinar uh, is going to be next month. Um, so here, I hope you can see this, uh, which will be about Delta, which is a GPU resource for Science Gateways, much in the same way that Cloud Bank is a, a cloud computing resource for Science Gateways. So I hope that that will be interesting to those of you who are joining the call today. Um, again, do please also give us feedback on uh, how this was for you. There is a link in chat from, from me about that. Um, so I'm just uh, having a look in chat real quick here to see if any other questions have come in. So far, none. So hey, Rob, if you have anything else you wish you could have said, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> oh, wait, here comes a question. Oh my goodness, it looks like a long one too. Um, so Lisa asks, what happens if the cloud bank credit for a grant is not enough to cover all costs for the funded project? Since the account is created by cloud bank and not the home institution, we have to create another project for the same PI in our infrastructure, then figure out the permissions and access to make resources in these two accounts communicate seamlessly, which adds more work to the local IT folks whose institution is not receiving any indirect from the grant. I think there should be a survey of institutions about cloud charges to see how many are actually applying indirect charges uh, to cloud infrastructure. I think many of us are not, uh, if not most of us, are just passing through the charges from the cloud vendors to the PIs, but still provide the PIs technical support and help manage their cloud resources so the researchers can focus on their research analytics instead of spending time on the system administration in the cloud. Uh, so that is a big comment. I think what, you know, that sounds like a perfect thing to go on the Padlet because I think that's the kind of thing you're interested in. Is that right, Rob? Yeah, that's, yeah. that. that is correct. And, you know, we, we are, in early days, Shava can comment more on this, but basically our objective is to be able to flip a switch so that there's no, you know, weeks long investment of IT resources to change an account over. We should be able to just simply change account ownership. And as I mentioned, um, maybe at, at high speed, we are trying to anticipate uh, end of uh, grant, end of period of performance, uh, well in advance so that there is an exit strategy. And that exit strategy may be to stay on the cloud. It may be to you know, provision data. It may be to get off the cloud, but whatever that is, we don't want that to become like the, the nasty surprise at the end of the three-year grant, let's say. So we really are focused on making that smooth. Perfect, thanks. Um, there are a couple other questions that come in, but I, 
that came in, but I do see we're at the top of the hour, and I know that um, we could make your contact information that uh, that general help email address available on our website too with the archive of this. Um, uh, and um, because there are questions about um, plans for sustainability of the cloud bank after the award ends, uh, also a question about um, current customers that you have. So um, I think this is been a really terrific resource for folks to hear about what CloudBank is offering. And I know it's it's just going to get better, <laughs> right? You guys are just making it better every day, figuring out um, how to support the community. Uh, so, um, so with that, I think I'll let folks uh, head off to their rest of their day. But I want to thank both you, uh, Shava and um, Rob, for pulling this together and, and sharing this with uh, all these gateway um, folks. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you. And I, I'm saving a chat. I, I will try to follow up with some of the, the answers there that we didn't get a chance to. Sure. Yeah. And if, if well, I know you know Mona, at least, I'm sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, at least I encourage you to reach out to them if they don't find you. So, anyway, thanks everyone uh, for joining do. us today. Yep. And we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you very much.